Greetings dear viewers, this is George from Ireland. I'm carrying on my series about the Irish oppression myth. I'm going to look more at the 17th century. Now, one thing about Ireland which is very often overlooked is that uh, until at least 1607 we were divided into clans. A clan is a very, very extended family and a clan would have, um, and they usually have the same surname and they'd have an approximate territory. Um, so we were a deeply divided society and there was near constant warfare between the different clans. People often look back to prior to the 1170s, before the English soldiers first came to Ireland, as though these, as though, as though these were halcyon days. Now, there was some uh, good done in Ireland at that time, the island, how the Irish saved civilization and all the rest of it. But uh, we were always squabbling over pasture. We were a semi-nomadic people and in ancient Irish poetry, the uh, standard imagery of uh, contentment was about a huge lowing herd of cattle. So we're wandering around the country seeking fresh pasture. Uh, and 1607 was the flight of the earls. James I thought that another rebellion was in the offing, was about to arrest some of our leaders. So they um, skedaddled, went to the continent, principally France, Spain, and so forth. Uh, so that's why we're often fighting. So a lot of the fighting in Ireland was, was nothing to do with the English being there. Sometimes uh, clans would enlist the help of uh, outsiders, English people, Scots, whoever, the Danes, um, prior to the 12th century uh, AD. So it shows that our Irish identity was not that important to us. We'd often rather take the side of a foreigner than a fellow Irishman, even people of the same religious denomination. Uh, so that was the downfall of the idea of clans and different territory. Uh, we used to wander around the country, not totally wandering around, it was semi-nomadic. There were some towns, uh, towns founded by the Danes. We had rah like hill forts, town lands prior to the Danes arriving in the um, 9th century AD. Um, what else? So the travellers, these are people who were supposedly displaced during the 17th century wars, started roaming the country and never ever stopped. Of course, some of them have stopped and have adopted a sedentary lifestyle, but in many cases they still wish to be regarded as travellers, despite that uh, word being a misnomer in their case now, because they were known by opprobrious names prior to the 90s. Um, now, about us uh, being nomadic, then the potato came from the American continent, and that made settled agriculture more viable. Not being absolute about this, I'm not saying it was impossible to have settled agriculture. We could grow crops like cabbages or whatever. Barley can be grown in Ireland. That makes much of our whiskey and um, beer, porter, that's black Irish beer. But it, um, Ireland is not as good for cereal crops as um, drier lands because we have to get such heavy rainfall being an island out into the North Atlantic. But it's the potato really caused a population explosion in Ireland, perhaps a bit too much. Um, I recall uh, some 18th century French visitors saying that an Irish woman will have a child every other year and we're incredibly healthy and robustious people because we're so energetic from eating all these potatoes. Um, so uh, clans had carried on in Scotland until well into the 18th century. To some extent they still do, people who know the clan chieftain is. Um, in the 16th century there been a policy of surrender and regrant, which is where um, Henry VIII, he wanted the uh, chieftains of the native Irish clans to um, give up their land, which they held in trust for the clan, and accept a title from him, that it didn't come from their people. Uh, and that was done. And so our um, upper class largely accepted titles from the King of Ireland, territorial titles, titles relating to a place. Um, clan chiefs were sometimes elected, but it wasn't primogenitor, but only people who were close blood relatives of the late chieftain could have the right to vote. It wasn't mass democracy. Brendan Behan claims that had this carried on, it would have developed into democracy with everyone being allowed to vote, which is a very unsafe assumption. One could look at the um, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Yes, he was elected by seven men. And no, by the 19th century, this was not leading to democracy or anything even close towards it. Though there was a democratic movement in Germany, it was not because the emperor was uh, elected. People often talk about English policy as being divide et impera. Well, I don't know of a single document or any speech by any English statesman where they express this divided rule policy. I challenge somebody to produce one. Perhaps there is, but I've never heard of it. 
There was no need for us to be divided by the English because we were already quite divided, as I pointed out. There were inter nissine warfare going on in Ireland for centuries. I'm not saying we're worse than any other country, it went on in other places as well. Um, I suppose it gave rise to this notion that we're the wild Irish, we genuinely have a taste for fighting. Um, so there are lots of rebellions in 16th century England, as I previously pointed out. There was a revolt against the so-called amicable grant, which was a forced loan, not amicable at all, nor a grant, a loan that would never be repaid to Henry VIII. There were stirrings of the Yorkists, well there was those Wars of the Roses in England, who I'll come back to that. Um, so several periods of fighting over the 30 years. Then there were pretenders coming along, like Perkin Warbeck and Lambert Simnel, sorry that's late 15th century. The Western Rebellion in the 1540s, the Pilgrimage of Grace in the 1530s, Kett's Rebellion, the Wyatt Plot, the Rodolphi Plot, uh, the Rebellion of the Northern Earls. Um, there will have been a few that I've forgotten, and that's not in chronological order. Um, so the government didn't control us so firmly in Ireland. The monarch could not project power so far from where he lived, and so the capital of Ireland and England was London, and I suppose Wales and eventually Scotland too. So in a time before means of locomotion, the fastest way to travel overland was by horse. And so the uh, monarch controlled South East England very effectively, because it was close to where he was, could send his army, and it's quite flat. The further from that, the weaker his control was. So he needed to cooperate with local potentates. Um, anyway, the monarch had fairly good control of the east coast of Ireland. The hinterland was not so strongly controlled by him. Anywhere on the coast, he could get a few miles in by shipping soldiers around, but that was that. So there were castles, and if a, uh, an aristocrat was not cooperating with a monarch, the monarch faced a choice, he could send an army, he could besiege the castle, it was difficult, but didn't want to make the situation worse, maybe just ignore it, try to reach a compromise. However, if a monarch was feeble, was not enforcing his will, then he would soon lose control of much of his territory. Other people would follow suit and not uh, dance to the monarch's tune. So that's the way it was. Nationalists and Republicans would always like to overemphasize the differences between Ireland and England. Indeed, there are differences, but they should not be exaggerated. Um, these, are, these differences are relative, not absolute. Um, anyway, so until the 17th century, the um, Irish crown didn't govern much of the country that strongly. It relied on the cooperation of the chieftains of the native uh, Irish clans, but the chieftains were gone in the 17th century. There's a bit of policy of diarchy. One could liken it to India prior to 1947, hereditary rulers cooperating with the central government. Though, of course, we were not a colony. Um, under, who was it, Edward I, Ireland, Wales and England, we briefly had a united parliament. And again, at the time of the British Republic in the 1740s, there was that special flag uniting the cross of St. George and the cross of St. Patrick, if I got that right. Oh, no, it was, it, was the, it was the gold harp on the blue field. By the way, the colour of Ireland is St. Patrick's blue, which is like a midnight blue. It is not green. It's only Thomas More, that early 19th century poet, not the English saint, who wrote about the Emerald Isle. Um, the, the United Irishmen in the 1790s, they adopted dark green as the Irish colour. How did I get this? Well, a lot of Republicans won't like to hear this. They got it because they were inspired by William of Orange. They took the Dutch flag with a blue and red, and if you mix a blue and a red, well, you could get um, uh, you could get um, purple, but with a bit of orange, it becomes more like green. And so that was that. They thought the Netherlands had um, political liberty because they had an elected head of state, Stadtholder, which William III had been, and they um, didn't discriminate against the Catholic minority too badly in the Netherlands. So where do I get to? Um, yeah, so some, some of Ireland was under direct royal administration and the Lord Deputy was in Dublin Castle. Cromwell's son, Henry, fulfilled that role for a while. He was also, uh, he was also the provost of Trinity College Dublin, something I think uh, people at Trinity would prefer to overlook these days. Um, so people had to do homage to the monarch and his representative, the Lord Deputy, paying tax and so forth. The 18th century, as I have noted, was remarkably peaceful. With sectarian clashes in the 1790s, I suppose land hunger, partly by because the population was increasing, sometimes unpopular landlords were thought to be rack renters, they had the property vandalised, their cattle stolen or slaughtered and people couldn't carry them away. 
um, a lot of agrarian terrorism, white boys, steel boys, oak boys, defenders, and so forth. Um, these were secret societies, so not much documentation exists on them. Um, some were exclusively Protestant, some were exclusively Catholic, a few were mixed, and they existed all around the country. But different groups might use the same name, but not have the same outlook. So not a great deal is known about them because they were clandestine. Um, and they weren't overtly political, often had quite local concerns. And the Orange Order started out as the Orange Boys, started out as one of these because the other group are coming to attack us, so we need to defend ourselves and blah, blah, blah. Um, anyway, many uh, Catholics in the 1790s did not regard um, uh, Protestants of any denomination as being Irish. The Catholic community was mostly Irish speaking in the 18th century. I saw some evidence submitted to the Irish Parliament in which one MP said that the Irish speaking cotier class has but one word for English and Protestant, and that is Sassanach. They just call them English, and often they did have English descent. But by the late 18th, 18th century, the Protestant community in Ireland uh, viewed itself as being Irish and called itself Irish. Um, so these uh, misdeeds of Protestants in Ireland are bogusly blamed on our English neighbours, and more widely on Great Britain. Um, anyway, uh, so um, Irish nationalism only started to exist in the 16, sorry, in the 1790s as we understand it.